Ministries, but I'll let you uh, tell more about yourself, your family, and your message. Okay, thank you. I don't, I don't need that. Okay, you got that. <laughs> <laughs> we figured out what was wrong with the microphone, so I've got the lapel mic. <laughs> For a minute. Well, praise the Lord. It's good to be here. Great to be in Christmas Valley my second time a few years ago. Amen. Here I'm back, and uh, this is just wonderful, and it's great to speak alongside of my friend James Rafferty. James and I have been friends for a long, long time. I don't know how many years it's been. And James, you know, I almost always agree with you. <laughs> almost <laughs> always we agree. But you said a couple of times that, trip, that this place is in the middle of nowhere. Oh. <laughs> and I don't know if I agree with that. <laughs> I don't know. Those of you, who lives here in Crystal Valley? Let me see your hand. Close. Let me see your hand. Just, just a few of you. Well, I think a little lot. You're not living right. Little lot. You're not living This is adjustable if you want to hire. Is that good here? Oh, the table's fine. So, I don't know. I mean, I, is this the middle of nowhere or not? I don't know. No. I mean, this is, God knows where we are. This is somewhere. And it's actually quite beautiful out here. Uh, I took a long walk this morning out in that little Cedar Lane road. It just went out. There's just a charm about the desert. Yes, just sir. living yes, out sir. here, yes, just sir. being out here, it's nice. So, God is good. Amen. Wonderful. He's good always. Uh, what was that? He's good always. He's good always. Uh, let me mention a couple of uh, White Horse Media has a brand new track. I see somebody got one of our packs of these. I don't know how many times. 30 or 40 packs that are at the table there. This just came out. It's got a picture of five people with different ethnic backgrounds with masks on, and their eyes are really big. And the question is, what's next? So we were we traveled here. My friend uh, Paul Selfie from Idaho came down here in the airport. To the rental car people, you know, we were passing these out, and I don't think anybody uh, that we offered this to looked at that and said, "No, I don't want to read that." People want to know what is next. So this is a great little track to share. Uh, we've got them over there at our booth, and then it gives you a Bible study, or the person who reads it, a Bible study on uh, the beast and the mark of the beast and the time when nobody can buy or sell and the coming of Jesus and the commandments of God, the faith of Jesus, and, uh, and what the big issues are, the Ten Commandments and the cross and, and God's love. So there's a lot packed into this. So we hope this will be a great resource for you. Uh, let me share something else with you that I'm going to do. Hope you, you like this. Uh, I'm going to do something I've never done before, ever, in a camp meeting or anywhere in a meeting like this. I am going to do something every time I speak, and I'm going to teach you how to sprout. <laughs> These days, we need to be healthy, right? right. Amen. I tell you, with the COVID concerns and all the other diseases and everything going on, People are really concerned about their health, and there's there's hardly anything you can do better for your body than to grow your own live food. And I have to teach a whole course on this, so I'm going to just show you this. And by the time we're done with camp meeting, you're going to be eating these. Okay, this is a this is a lentils. You can get lentils just about any market. Very easy to get. Uh, I don't even think these are organic, but I still sprout it anyway. So you can buy lentils for about a buck any market. And all you need is a jar. Put them in a jar, and I've got about an inch worth here. And what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to take my water, show you how easy this is. And I'm going to pour this water in here. And I'm going to let these sit until tonight. And tonight, when I come back from my meeting, they're going to be twice as big. That's right. They're going to grow up about to here. And then I'm just going to water the grass, pour out the water. And I'm going to rinse these every time I come. And then by Saturday night, we're going to have a whole jar full of sprouts that we can put into uh, our salads. So once yeah. you learn how easy this is, I tell you, you can do it. The motto of my course is you can do it. Uh, I explained this to I Shelley Quinn. Shelley Quinn at 3 a.m. She got so excited about sprouting. <laughs> She started texting me her pictures of her lentils growing up, and then she texted me again, and she said, Steve, I just love these sprouts, and I'm eating them every day. So anyway, uh, hopefully.
Basically, this will motivate you to grow your own food in your own house, very simple, and to pump your body with a lot, lot of nutrition. Do you only do lentils? Oh, no, I do a whole bunch. In fact, I have a little picture here of me and my son and my daughter with lots of different sprouts and microgreens, and I teach a whole course on how to grow all kinds. So this is just a little, if the website is sproutingwithsteve.com, okay. sproutingwithsteve.com. So this will give you a little taste and hopefully it will motivate you to start growing your own food. Uh, this series that I'm going to do here, this, uh, this camp meeting, is on Revelation chapter 17. We are going to have an intense Bible study, Amen. verse by verse going through Revelation chapter 17. I've written a, a book on this. We've had about 9,000 of these recently, and now we have about 1,000 left because they're selling quick. They're only for a couple dollars. We have a bunch of those over at the table, and it's called The Bloody Woman and the Seven-Headed Beast. The Bloody Woman. You like that title? Yeah. The Bloody Woman and the Seven-Headed Beast. So that's what we're going to be studying here. Uh, this is going to be... An amazing study. I have been, I was telling James this morning for breakfast that I've done a lot of research in Revelation 17. Uh, this chapter has just gripped me. I've been studying prophecy. I've been a Christian since uh, 1979. The Lord has really blessed my life. Uh, and I have a wonderful wife, Kristen, and two children. I can totally relate to James and his uh, mm -hmm. He's talking about his son and his daughter and our, the love we have for our children. And, uh, and God has just been so good to me. And if you know about White Horse Media, you know that we focus on prophecy and the end times. And we, we put Jesus in the middle of everything. That's what we really want to do. Uh, lift him up higher and higher. Talk about the ultimate price that he paid. And just a couple years ago, uh, it just gripped my heart to study Revelation chapter 17. It's a very... It's a very difficult chapter in many ways. It's very challenging. Uh, it's deep. It's powerful. It's about a woman riding a seven-headed, ten-horned beast. Uh, and so this first meeting, I'm going to talk about the woman. And the next meeting tonight, I'll talk about the seven-headed, ten-horned beast, what that's all about. And then it talks about later on in the chapter where the angel says, there are seven kings and five have fallen. And one is, and the other one is coming for a short space. So we'll talk about that in the third meeting. And then the last meeting is called Ten Horns at War with the Lamb. It talks about the ten horns on the beast who finally unite together, give their power to the beast, and they war on Jesus. And then it talks about the followers of Jesus who are called and chosen and faithful, who are friends of God, who are <clears throat> true followers of Christ in these last days. So all of this we're going to be looking at and unraveling uh, in these next four meetings. How's that sound? Amen. Yeah, interesting? It's going to be very interesting. And I'll also let you know that in our church, uh, there really is no cons complete consensus on all of the details of this chapter. There are different views on Revelation 17. And I've looked at these views. I've studied them. Pray that God would help me to understand this chapter. And what I'm going to do uh, this camp meeting is I'm going to share with you the best as I can with the help of the Lord and the Holy Spirit uh, what makes the most sense to me. And of course, I want you to study this yourself. Be a Berean. Study this out. Uh, and as I look at different views, I've concluded that uh, I want to gravitate toward the view that has the least... Uh, difficulties, and that makes the most sense. Amen. The most sense. And so that's the conclusion that I've come to. So uh, I consider this a journey, Revelation 17. I believe that as we get closer to the final events, God is going to lead his people into this chapter, and that it's going to get clearer and clearer and clearer to the group of us as we get closer to the final events. Uh, another reason why I'm convicted about Revelation 17 is it comes right before what chapter? Revelation 18, which is all about the angel coming down from heaven and lightening the earth with its glory and giving one last call to the people of the earth 
which in our church we call the loud cry. The final cry, the final call of God to people all around the world to be ready for the coming of Jesus. And I'm just uh, impressed that Revelation 17 comes right before chapter 18. Really? And I believe that the more we understand 17, this is part of the preparation that God wants us to have to become more prepared to be used by him to give the loud cry in Revelation chapter 18. So that's why we're studying this. So uh, let's pray together. If you want to just you know, bow your head, I'm going to kneel up here. Of course, you can kneel if you'd like. And let's pray that the Lord, the God of heaven, will help us as we dive in to one of the most uh, amazing chapters in the Bible. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, Father, thank you for gathering us here together Amen. In, in Christmas Valley, Oregon. We are way out. Uh, seems kind of like in the middle of nowhere, but there's people that live out here. It's, it has a beauty out here. We're out in nature. We're surrounded by just miles and miles uh, that we can see the sun come up and the sun go down and and we've gathered together to really ultimately hear your voice. Thank you for the people that have helped to uh, prepare the way for this camp meeting. Amen. And Lord, now we pray that you will take charge and that you will speak to us and help us to learn from Revelation chapter 17 and teach us more about, about Jesus, the Lamb, and the ultimate sacrifice that he made for us. <clears throat> Please give us your Holy Spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Are you ready? Ready, ready. I actually have a lot of slides for this talk, but as you can see, we have no screen here. So I am screenless. And I am slideless. But I am not Bibleless. We still have God's Word, and we have the Holy Spirit. So let's just uh, take a look. Revelation chapter 17, verse 1, starting out. John wrote this, and he said, There came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials. And he talked with me, and he said to me, Come here, and I will show to you the judgment of the great whore that sits upon many waters. Now, I tell you, if that doesn't impress you, now just the first verse is gripping. Uh, the context of this chapter, as I look at this, is one of the seven angels who has the seven vials. Uh, this tells me that this is a, a chapter that is particularly relevant for those that are living in the end time. The seven last, the seven vials are the seven last plagues, which are poured out in Revelation chapter 16. And then in chapter 17, we have this angel, and he comes to John, and he explains to him the reason for the judgment that's coming upon the great whore, which is was just uh, described in chapter 16. So we have one of the end time angels, one of the seven angels. Now, did this, does one of these angels have a name? No, he probably does. I mean, if these are literal angels that pour out the plagues, this angel probably, it was a personal angel probably has a name. We maybe don't know his name. Maybe we'll get to meet this angel. Uh, and he came over to John, and it says, John says, he talked with me. The angel talked with me. How would you like to have the angel talk to you? You'll get to meet your guardian angel one of these days. Maybe you'll meet this angel. Maybe you'll meet the other six angels of the seven angels. We'll meet Gabriel. We'll meet Jesus. We'll get to meet many different angels, and we'll get to talk to them. We'll get to know their names. 
what their names are. And as I, as I look at this, uh, one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, came and talked with me. You know, it just, it, it, this impresses me that God wants to talk to us. Amen. He talks to us primarily these days in his word. He talks to us through the, through the Holy Spirit and then also through his providence. God has different ways. He talks to us through nature. He talks to us even out in the desert. As we look at the, uh, the, the beauties that are, that are still around us. God wants to talk with me. He wants to talk with you. He talked to John. And we trust that this weekend, you know, our goal of being here is that the Lord will talk to our hearts. Isn't that what you want? Amen. Isn't that why you're here? Amen. Isn't that why you drove all the way out here into the desert? You want God to talk to you. And, it, it, and many times we have to get away from all of the, the confusion and the voices and the, the multitude of the confusion that's in this world so we can sit down and be quiet and let the Lord talk with us. That's what God wants to do while we're here. And those that are watching, I think that this is going live, isn't that right? On Facebook, he wants to talk to you too. He talked with me and he said to me, he said to me, come here. Now, I'm going to build my case as I go along. This is a big issue when it comes to understanding this chapter. Now, I'm going to step by step try to build what I believe is a very reasonable and sensible case that in Revelation 17, what's happening is this angel is calling John away from his time, away from the first century. He says to him, come here. The angel didn't go to, to where John was. He said, John, I want you to come here to where I am. I'm one of the seven last plague angels down near the end of time. And so he said, come here. And then he says, I will show to you the judgment of the great whore that sits upon many waters. Now, uh, this is a, a judgment. The angel is going to show John the judgment. He's going to show us the judgment. And I want to put the word, uh, that the word just in this, that all of God's judgments are just. Amen. The angel came to show us and John the just judgment from a God who is love, a God who is full of mercy and compassion, and yet he's also just. And there comes a time, finally, when his just judgment falls. And as we read this chapter, it'll become very clear why God gives and sends a just judgment upon this great whore. Because this great whore is very evil. She's done a lot of really, really, really bad things. And so the time finally comes when God's justice comes. And Revelation 17 uh, talks about that. Now notice, he said, I will show you the judgment that's coming upon who? It says, the great whore. Now, I've been impressed with this. Like I mentioned, I've been studying this chapter. It's gripped me for a long time, for a couple of years, and I've just been going over and over, I probably have memorized the entire chapter. I could probably lay it in bed at night just by myself and go down through the whole thing, top to bottom, because these verses are just in my head. The Holy Spirit has just impressed me that he wants me to know this chapter. The great whore that sits upon many waters. It's a lot of what this chapter is all about. When, when a person understands it, and the idea of 
the great whore points us in one direction. And we need to figure out, by looking at the clues of this chapter, who is the great whore. This is a, it's not a, it's not a little whore. It's not a minor whore. It's the great whore. The big one. And uh, a whore is, is a prostitute, is a woman who has departed from right principles and has gone in, gone in a direction of seduction and deception. Uh, a woman in the Bible, in the book of Revelation and in Matthew 25 and other places, a woman symbolizes what? Church. A woman symbolizes a church. That's right. There's actually two primary women in the book of Revelation. Chapter 12 is the woman clothed with the sun. She's clothed in white. She's the pure woman. And then in Revelation 17, we have the fallen woman. So the book of Revelation, in many ways, is the story of two women. The good woman and the bad woman. And as we get into this, we'll see that there's a time when the bad woman persecutes the good woman. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. But, you know, in the Christian world, there's all kinds of different views on prophecy. Many different ideas, just like with everything else. There's ideas in politics, social media, uh, all around us. There's all kinds of different views. And, and when we understand the truth in the Bible that there is the great whore, what it does is it opens your mind up and points us in a direction of studying the entire history of Christianity. It, it helps us to understand the historicist view of prophecy, that there was uh, a church at the beginning of the Christian era that started out pure. Uh, ex, uh, Ephesus is the first church in the, uh, the letters of Jesus to the seven churches. There's Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, and then there's Philadelphia and Laodicea. Ephesus was the first church. And it was a good church when you read about that in Revelation chapter 2. It was a pure church. It, uh, it was full of uh, works for God. It loved Jesus. It had a first love for the Lord because it knew, the early Christians knew, what the magnitude of the sacrifice that the Father and the Son had made for humanity. And that's what launched the gospel. That's what launched Pentecost. That's what uh, was the power of the Holy Spirit that came down and the, and the Christian church just spread all over the world, the then known world. They were just empowered to share the love and the sacrifice and the price that Jesus Christ for sinners. But then when you get into, you look at the Ephesus church, Jesus said, nevertheless, I have something against you. He said, you have left your first love. And then he said, remember therefore from where you have fallen and repent and do the first works. And what's happening is in Ephesus, Jesus is telling them that there, there was a, they were beginning to fall. In the history of Christianity, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul predicted that there would be a great falling away that would come before the return of Jesus. And, and the church beginning to fall from grace and from love and from Jesus and his righteousness and his word, eventually it fell so far that it finally historically developed into the great whore that sits upon many walls. And most Christians generally have no concept of that. When they think about the end times, Bible prophecy, the last days, they, many of them think, well, the rapture is going to come, and we're going to disappear, and then the beast is going to come, the antichrist is going to come, the mark of the beast is going to come, it's going to come all after we're gone. And they have generally no concept of, of a falling away in the history of the church, a departure from biblical truth, a 
departure from Jesus and the Bible and the Holy Spirit that has resulted in the formation of this woman, this great whore that sits upon many waters. And if we just grasp just this first verse, that God wants to talk to us, this is an end time chapter, and that, there, that God's judgments are just, and that there is this woman called the great whore, you know, it opens our minds and it helps us to understand what has happened in the history of Christianity. So it's very valuable for us to understand this truth. Now notice it says that the great whore, she sits. What does she sit upon? It says she sits upon many waters. Now, before we even go to verse 2, let's go down to verse 15. The angel said to John in verse 15, he said to me, the waters which you saw where the whore sits. All right, we just read that in verse 1. The whore is sitting upon many waters. And then verse 15, the angel then explains to John what the waters mean. What are the waters? It says, the waters which you saw where the whore sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. In other words, she sits on, on peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages all around the world. Amen. People are supporting her. And they're supporting this woman because they don't know that she is the great whore. They have no idea who she really is. If they knew who she was, they wouldn't support her. Right? But they don't know. We have this chapter, Revelation 17, deals with powerful themes. And you've got, at the very introduction, it's talking about this great whore that is being supported by people all over the world. Now, I tell you, that is impressive. And don't you think God wants us to understand that? Amen. As we move into chapter 18 and give the loud cry, the last call to come out of Babylon, the last rays of light to a fallen world, God wants us to understand what's going on in this world. And this chapter helps us to clarify what is actually going on. And again, most, most people have no clue. They don't know there is a great whore. They don't know that they're supporting her uh, and her involvement with the leaders of this world. When we go to verse 2, it goes into more detail about this woman. It says, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. So here we have kings leaders, kings, and kingdoms all around the world are committing fornication, which means they're having an unlawful relationship with this woman. So we have this woman that represents a fallen church, a great poor, and she's involved with the kings of the earth. And they are, the kings are supporting her, that state power. So we have a church that is being supported by state power. Yeah. And that's a big problem because God's church doesn't need to be supported by state power. What kind of power do we need to be supported by? Yeah. Now, Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. His kingdom is, uh, is from, from another land. And the power that God's church needs to rely on to advance his truth in this world is the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's not the power of government. It's not the power of the state. Amen. And what's happening in history and in prophecy is that a church, the church eventually fell away from Jesus, compromised step by step, and then especially in the 4th century in the time of Constantine, began to unite with the power of government and the power of the state in order to advance 
the cause of Christianity. And that was a huge mistake. So learning this chapter teaches us that you know, we don't want to fall away from Jesus like the woman did. We need to rely on God. We need to rely on his word. We need the Lord to talk to us. And we need to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit instead of the power of government. Is there some light here for us? A lot of light. A lot of light in these chapters, in these verses. Every word is full of light. Uh, something else impresses me when it says the kings of the earth have committed fornication with this woman. You have the, the kings of the earth, the leaders of the earth, the authorities of the earth, the people look to and trust in. Uh, these kings have ultimately, they're connecting with the whore. They're connecting with a woman that is leading people astray. And Romans chapter 13 tells us that we should respect uh, governments and civil authorities which we should. We should be good citizens as much as possible. Mm -hmm. But let's make no mistake about it that the kings of the earth and the governments of the earth are not infallible. And they can make big mistakes. And so while we respect authority, we also have to realize that God is our ultimate authority. And we need to rely upon his word and the Holy Spirit more than the, the governments and the civil authorities of this world. Because they can make big mistakes. Is there a lesson for us in that? Mm -hmm. There surely is. The kings of the earth have committed fornication, unlawful connection. And then it says, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So we have the great whore, we have the kings of the earth, we have people around the world that uh, support this woman, and then we have the inhabitants of the earth. And that's the people of this world. So I tell you, this chapter is powerful. It's like a, it's a little portal, it's a window from God's perspective of what's really happening in this world. And you're not gonna, you're not gonna learn this on CNN. <laughs> not going to get this from Fox News. Nope. You're not going to get this information uh, most of the time from social media. Most of it. You're not going to find it by going to many of the well-established channels of information and communication that we're, you know, that we look to these days. We're, we're going to get the real scoop, the inside information from God's book, Amen. from the Bible. If we hear the voice of the angel who talks to us and helps us to understand these big monumental issues, that's what we need to be doing. The word of God is powerful. Now it says that the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk. The word drunk, you know, it, it implies when people get drunk, they're confused. They can't you don't want to drive if you're drunk. You don't want to get drunk at all. But people that do get drunk, you don't want to drive when you're drunk because you're dangerous. Your, your, your response time is affected. You can't think clearly. You're not sober. And that's the way the people of this world are. It says they're, they're drunk, they're confused, and they're drunk with the wine as the wine of her fornication. Wine refers to teaching. Jesus said, when he talked about his teaching, he said you must put new wine into new wineskins. And that refers to his teaching. And then he talked about the Pharisees, and he said, there's the old wineskins. So when you put the, the, their teachings in the old wineskins, they're just going to break. He said you must put new wine in new wineskins. And Jesus was contrasting his teaching with the teachings of the religious leaders. And one thing that just impresses me about this verse is that God wants our doctrines as far as possible to be pure. He wants us to drink the pure teachings of the Word, the pure teachings of the Bible. 
the pure teachings of the Lamb, of the Father and the Son, and their sacrifice and the plan of salvation, he does not want us to be confused. And there's so much confusion in this world, isn't there? So much confusion, so much lying that is deceptive, that is confusing people, false teachings. And uh, I've, been, I've been through, some of you have heard some of my testimony about some of the struggles I've been through in the last few years. Uh, I've had some real battles in my life, some real dark days. And God has used those dark days to teach me things that I could never have learned any other way. And some of the main lessons that I've learned in my dark days is to rely upon what he says in his book mm -hmm. rather than teachings of men. And even my own mind, my own heart, I can't trust myself. I've got to rely on what God says above, above everything else. In fact, if you go to chapter 17 and look at verse uh, 17, very end of the verse, chapter 17, verse 17, at the end of the verse, it says, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. I've really been impressed with that. That God's words are going to be fulfilled. Amen. The key to our Christian life, the key to our growth in grace, the key to our relationship with Jesus, to becoming a friend of God, to having a close walk with him, to understanding the cross, to understanding his love for us. The key to all of this is accepting and surrendering to the words of God. The words of God are more important than the words of men. Absolutely. The wine of God is more important than the wine of Babylon. Right. We need to stay with Jesus and learn a lesson from history that even Christians can fall away and become the great whore. God doesn't want that to happen to us. He wants us to stay close, close to his word, because the words of God are going to be fulfilled. I have no doubt about that. Uh, even though this, the book of Revelation was written 2,000 years ago, today the words of God are going to be fulfilled. No question about it. So we need to get grounded are, are being able to give the loud cry message in chapter 18 has a lot to do with us being grounded in chapter 17 in the words of God and in the Lamb. Jesus Christ is, is the Lamb. So, uh, we've only gone through two verses. Let's see, we still got another almost a half an hour. Yeah. I want to keep going? Yeah. Well, we go deeper. Yes, we do. I've only gotten through two verses. And you see why this chapter is written? It's just powerful. When you read it and think about it and meditate on it, there's a lot of light in these words of God, which are going to be fulfilled. So verse 3 says, So he carried me away into the Spirit. Do you have a comment you are going to mention? Oh, yeah. Well, we'll get to that. Yeah, 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 yeah. He carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we're, we'll get there. Yeah, okay. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to build my case. That there, are, there are, as I said, there's a lot of different views in, this, in, in our church on this topic. There have been view, different views for a long time. And I'm aware of a lot of those views. I've looked at those views on different sides, trying to figure out this out and pray, Lord, help me to understand what this is talking about. And one of the pillar issues is the, is the point of time, you might say, or the point of reference when this chapter applies to. Now, there are many views, or some views, that say that this chapter is from the perspective of John's day, because John wrote the book. He wrote this chapter, and so they look at the five are fallen, one is, the other one's not yet come. They look at a lot of this from the point of reference of John in the first century when he was on the island of Patmos as a, an old fisherman who had been banished uh, and he was there as a prisoner when he got the book of Revelation. I don't agree with that. I don't agree that this chapter is from the perspective of, uh, of John today. 
and I'm going to try to build a sensible, reasonable case for that conclusion. And the first part, as I mentioned, the angel said, come here. He's a, one of the seven last plague angels, and he says, come here. The second point is that verse 3 says, John says, so he carried me away. He carried me away in the spirit. And I, I'm convinced, this is my honest, conscientious conviction, and, and, and let me just say, I don't, uh, you know, if people disagree with me on certain points of this, I don't believe that God writes people's names out of the book of life because they don't agree with me. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't accept that philosophy. I think, you know, if, there, if we have different opinions, let's come together, let's take a look at it, let's pray for God's guidance. Sometimes we don't all see eye to eye on everything. Uh, I, I've mentioned this before. I think I mentioned it to James that I don't believe God is going to judge us on the seven heads. He's going to judge us on the Ten Commandments. Amen. Amen. And the Ten Commandments have to do with love for God and love for our neighbor as ourselves. Amen. He's going to love us. He's going to judge us on how we respond to his grace and, and how we treat other people. So I've, you know, I've gotten some emails from some people as I've shared my Bloody Woman book and my views on Revelation 17 from some people, a number of people, not a whole lot, but some people have just blasted me. And it's almost like, if you don't see it my way, you're doomed. <laughs> and I, don't, I think that that's a wrong attitude. Mm -hmm. I think we should tread softly and we should be humble and teachable mm -hmm. and that God is going to lead a people and as we get closer to the end, I think these issues are going to get clearer and clearer. Mm -hmm. And that God wants us to study this chapter. He wants us to be studying these. So as I've looked at this, I remember once when I was reading this chapter, I was very impressed with the fact that John says he carried me away. And I believe it was away from his time. Down the stream of time, he was taken away in the, in the Spirit. And that tells me also that we have to have the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. in order to understand the Bible. Mm -hmm. If we're not being led by the Holy Spirit, we're not going to come to correct conclusions. That's right. We've got to be led by God. Mm -hmm. We have to let His Word be our guide. We need the Holy Spirit. In fact, the whole book of Revelation starts out in chapter 1 where John says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And then I turned around and he saw Jesus and Jesus gave him the book of Revelation. So we have to be in the Holy Spirit. We have to pray for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit to guide us in what this is talking about. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I looked at that and I thought, there's, there's got to be some significance to the word wilderness. Don't you think? Mm -hmm. The more you study Revelation 17, I tell you, every single word has uh, impact. It's significant. And the word wilderness is significant. And I, I learned, as I looked at this and studied and prayed and asked for God to help me, that the word wilderness is used three times in the book of Revelation. Just three. First, or Here's one of them, where John goes into the wilderness and he sees a woman. He sees this whore, this great whore. Now the two other times it's used are in Revelation chapter 12. And if you remember, uh, in Revelation chapter 12, verse 6 and verse 14, what happens is the pure woman, the woman clothed with the sun, who's standing on the moon, which means she's She's reflecting the light of the sun because that's what the moon does. The moon reflects the light of the sun. When you see a full moon up there and it's bright, it's bright because the light you're seeing is the sun, not the moon. It's reflecting the light of the sun. And in Revelation 12, there's a woman standing upon uh, the moon and she's clothed with the sun. And there's a lesson for us in that, and that is that the true church, our mission is to reflect Reflect the light of the sun. Amen. We're here to reflect Jesus, Amen. not to reflect ourselves. Amen. We're just reflectors. <laughs> we're, we're in God's image. 
And that's his plan for us. So in Revelation 12, verse uh, uh, 6 and verse 14, the true woman flees where? Into the wilderness. Twice it says wilderness. Chapter 12, verse 6, she flees into the wilderness. And chapter 12, verse uh, 14, she flees into the wilderness. And she goes there for how long? Anybody know? For 1260 days or years in prophecy. So the 1260 year period is when the true church was in the wilderness. And my conviction is that she was there, that the true woman was, was down. The true woman was persecuted. The true woman was uh, you know, in, a, in a down under state during the 1260 because the false woman was making war on her. But then at the end of the 1260, which occurred in what year? Who knows? What year was the end of the 1260 years? 1798. In 1798, the, the true woman starts coming out of the wilderness. And what happens to the false woman? She gets wounded in 1798. And she's now in the wilderness. So the true church is in the wilderness for 1260, and the false church is on top. But then at the end of the 1260, and from 1798 onward, the true woman is coming out of the wilderness, and the false woman has been wounded. But that wound will be healed, which we'll get to as we keep going through this chapter. So anyway, I'm building my case. If John is taken into the wilderness, which connect, I connect with chapter 12, and now it's a time where the woman, she's not as, she's not as powerful as she was. But her power is going to come back. Now, as you keep reading, it says she's sitting. Now, let, let me, here's another, another point. Uh, when John sees this woman sitting upon a scarlet-colored beast in verse 3, he's carried away, and he sees this woman in the wilderness. He sees a fully formed woman. In Revelation 13, he saw a beast rising up, showing that that beast was coming in the future. But in chapter 17, this woman is not going to, is not, uh, he doesn't see her rise up. He's taken by the Holy Spirit away into the wilderness, and he sees the great whore who has already been around for a long time. He's taken far beyond his own day, and he sees this woman. She's already great. She's already been fornicating with kings. She's already made people drunk with wine. And now he sees her sitting upon this, this, uh, this animal this creature. Now, what's the color of that creature? I saw a woman sitting upon a scarlet colored beast. And that's very interesting, scarlet colored. And I'll talk about this tonight, that there are three seven-headed, ten-horned beasts in Revelation. The only place in the Bible we have seven-headed, ten-horned beasts. The only place is Revelation. And there's three of them. There's one in chapter 12, who's red, there's one in chapter 13 that has a body like a leopard, feet like a bear, mouth like a lion. And then there's one in chapter 17 that is scarlet color. So they're similar, but they're different. They're not exactly the same. A little bit different. And scarlet, uh, this woman is sitting upon a beast that is scarlet color. And I thought about that. and. Uh, my daughter, she's 13, Abby, her favorite verse in the Bible is Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, that says, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Amen. So scarlet represents sin in contrast to what is white. And it, it, this has impressed me that the reason why this beast is scarlet is because it is full of sin. It is a sin beast. 
And we know in the Bible, what is sin? Sin is breaking God's law. So this beast and this woman are, are lawbreakers. She's a law-breaking woman, and this is a law-breaking beast. And it is uh, scarlet color. And that also impresses me that God does not want us to follow the ways of sin, but he wants us to be to have our sins washed away so there is white as snow. Amen. So when we see the great whore, there's a lesson for us, don't fall away. When we read about the wine that the whole world drinks, there's a lesson for us that we need to make sure we drink the pure wine of Bible truth. When we see the color of this beast, it impresses us that God wants to call us away from sin, and he wants to clothe us with the white garments of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Amen. And wash our sins away. Amen. So there's, you know, there's a lot of lessons in this chapter that are very personal and practical. This is not just theory. We need the Holy Spirit. We need Jesus. We need his white garments. We need his righteousness. We need to follow his word. We need to follow the Lamb, which we'll get to. He's the center of, uh, of this chapter. So a woman is sitting upon a scarlet colored beast, and it says, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Now, I looked at that recently, and I, and I, I noticed something that this beast in Revelation 17 is full of names of blasphemy. If you go back to chapter 13 and you look at the, the, uh, the previous beast, it says in verse 1, I stood upon the sand of the sea, I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy, singular. So the beast in chapter 13 has one main blasphemous name. And at the end of chapter 13, it says, here is wisdom. Let him that has understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and it's 666. And the previous verse says, it's the number of his name. So the beast of chapter 13 has a, has a, a primary name that calculates to 666, but in chapter 17, it's expanded, and now this beast is full of names. Lots of names. Have you ever heard the principle repeat and enlarge, repeat and enlarge? When you study Daniel and Revelation, Daniel 2 gives us a basic outline. Daniel 7 repeats and enlarges. Daniel 8 built on Daniel 7, repeats and enlarges. And Daniel 9, through the rest of the book, we have an enlarging of the things that are in the previous chapters. In Revelation chapter 2 and 3, we have Jesus going through the seven churches which takes you down through history, from Ephesus, where the fall first began, and then the Smyrna and Pergamos, and then the Dark Ages, where the woman Jezebel is uh, coming into the church. And you've got the whole history of Christianity right there in Revelation 2 and 3. But then as you keep reading Revelation, the principle of repeat and enlarge, it keeps enlarging, enlarging, enlarging. The first seven-headed beast is in chapter 12. Then there's more information in chapter 13, enlarging. And then when you get to chapter 17, it enlarges more. So the one name in chapter 13 then becomes full of names. And the woman is now sitting on many waters, which represent nations, tongues, people all around the planet. And all the people of the earth are drunk with the wine. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. So by the time you get to chapter 17, basically, it's gone global. We've gone global. And this is a Big chapter. Verse 3 says it has seven heads and ten horns. Now, I'm going to talk about this more tonight. There's something conspicuous about those seven heads and ten horns that are not there. Maybe I should, maybe I should give you the punchline. I'll wait for tonight. There's something really important about those seven heads and ten horns in verse, uh, verse 3. Verse 4 says, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color. Now look at her colors. The early church was arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. The early church was clothed with the righteousness of Christ. And it went out conquering and conquering. But by the time you get to this woman, she has given up the righteousness of Jesus. 
she has given up the fine linen right and clean. And she has been seduced by the temptation to connect with the kings of the earth and to become a powerful woman and to, uh, to gather around herself the garments of royalty. So there's a lesson for us in, in this. Don't be seduced by the temptations and the glitter and the, the offerings of the world. It's a game. written, Mystery Babylon the Great. She's the great whore. Babylon the Great, and she's also called what? The Mother of Arles. That to me is very significant. This woman is the mother. But is she the only woman? No. no she has daughters. She has harlot daughters. And this tells me that the time point of this chapter is post-Reformation. It's beyond the time when the Protestant churches left the mother. But then, as time goes on, they eventually compromise, and then they rejoin mom. See that? And this chapter, when John sees this woman, she's already fully formed. She's already been involved with kids. She's already made the world drunk with her wine. And she is already a mother who has daughters. See that point? That's a compelling point, don't you think? Very compelling point. This is post-Reformation. And she is the mother of the harlots and abominations of the earth. Verse 6 says, I saw the woman and she was drunk with the blood of the saints. She's been persecuting for hundreds of years by the time John sees her. So John is not in his day anymore. He is taken in the spirit far beyond his day, down the stream of time, down to the time after 1798, when now this woman is in the wilderness, she's in a wounded state, and she has a whole history behind her of bloodshed and fornication with kings. And she's a mother with her daughters. And she's a persecuting woman. She's drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. This is why I titled my book, The Bloody Woman and the Seven-Headed Beast. Now, the idea of the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, I think about what James said earlier today about the sacrifice that that the father made and the son made. And when you think about the fact that there have been martyrs and saints down throughout Christian history, which most Christians are clueless about. They just think about the end times, the rapture, the antichrist, the future. They have generally, they've forgotten 1,500 years of apostasy and the rise of the great whore and the bloody persecution against the martyrs of Jesus. That's been lost sight of. And those martyrs, you know, Abraham made the ultimate sacrifice when he was willing to offer his son. And these martyrs have seen that sacrifice. They've seen that love. They've seen the father and the son and the suffering that they've been through, and they have decided I'm on the side of Jesus Christ no matter what. I'm not going to go with the kings of the earth. I'm not going to drink the wine of Babylon. I'm not going to follow this, this great whore. I'm going to stick to the word. I'm going to stick to Jesus. I'm going to be led by the Holy Spirit. And even if I have to die for my faith, 
and to make the ultimate sacrifice that I can make, I'm willing to do it because Jesus made that sacrifice for me. Amen. 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 I tell you, there's a lot of power in this chapter. And God wants us to have the faith of the martyrs, the faith of the saints who are willing in the final crisis when we go into the loud cry and give the final message and expose the woman, the mother and the daughters, and the things that are happening in the final days, you know, we're going to get into trouble. A lot of pressure. We talk about the pressure that's coming against people now through social media, cancel culture, and you know, not going along with the crowd. I tell you, if we give the message of chapter 17 and chapter 18 as it is written in the Word of God through the power of the Holy Spirit and lift up Jesus, many of us are going to get into big trouble. And we need to be willing to endure that and to actually accept it joyfully to follow in the footsteps of the Master to suffer for Christ as Jesus suffered we're willing to suffer, and the greatest privilege that anybody can ever have is to share in the sufferings of Jesus. Amen. Amen. To participate in his sufferings to some extent, and to be willing to give our lives for the Lord who gave his life for us. When John saw this woman drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, he says, I, when I saw her, I wondered. Now, the, the King James says great admiration. Uh, admiration is not really the best translation of that word. Uh, in the margin of my Bible, and other Bibles say this, great amazement. John was amazed. He was shocked at what he saw. And as I wind this up, I tell you, there's only one, there's only one church that fits every detail of this prophecy, whose cardinals have the colors of uh, purple and scarlet, who is involved with kings, who's a great and mighty church that influences people all over the world, that has communicated wine and teachings that the whole world uh, has been drinking, that is a persecuting woman that has drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, that, that has daughters that came out of her, but have step by step chosen to reunite with the mother. There's only one church that fits this prophecy. And in chapter 18, it also says, come out of her, my people. God has his own people. Some people say this is the Roman Empire of John's day. No, it isn't. It's not the Roman Empire of John's day. This is a church down week C in the end times. And Revelation 18.4 says, Come out of her, my people. And that shows that God has people inside this church that are his people in the mother and the daughter. That are the people of God that he loves, that he cares for, that are following him, following Jesus as best they can. And when these final issues hit, they need to come out. They need to be separate from this woman. Separate from the mother, separate from the daughters. We can't afford to step by step go in her direction. Amen. Because if we do, we're in danger of ultimately receiving and sharing in the just judgment that is going to finally fall upon this woman because of her horrific crimes. That's why God sends judgments upon her, because she's killed his kids. She's drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, the, the blood of God's own children. So finally, at the end of time, Mercy runs out for this woman, and justice comes upon her. And that's what we'll continue to study about tonight, um, Friday night, and Saturday night. So I hope you've been uh, inspired by part one 
of our study on exploring Revelation chapter 17. Amen. 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 You're welcome. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us this chapter and the lessons that are in this chapter for us. Please uh, inspire us to be true followers of the Lamb who paid the ultimate price. You paid the price. Jesus paid the price. The Holy Spirit paid the price. And we want to be those that follow you and the Bible and Jesus all the way, no matter what. Amen. Give us the Holy Spirit this week, Andrew. Lord, talk to us. As the angel talked to John, Lord, talk to us. Talk to our hearts. And may this uh, camp meeting be a big blessing to all of us. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.